We've all seen images like this before. These are media ecosystem maps, showing that the broader left wing and right wing exist in their own media bubbles. What this means is, if you're a left wing person, you're much more likely to encounter media and opinions online that reinforce your worldview, and you rarely have that view challenged. Same with right wing people in their own bubble. As a result, a story might go viral in one sphere and barely even be noticed in another. This past week, two very similar stories went viral around the same time, one of them commented heavily on by right-leaning people and virtually ignored by the left, and the other the inverse, commented heavily on by left-leaning people and virtually ignored by the right. So let's take a look at them both. Firstly, the right-wing story. A video clip went viral of two teenagers in a stolen car, ramming into a cyclist in Las Vegas. I'm not going to play the whole clip because I don't want my channel to get nuked, but basically, these kids are laughing, speeding by other drivers. One yells at the other, hit him. They ram into his back, he shatters the windshield, and then falls onto the road. Ready? Yeah, 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 yeah. Hit his ass. The two kids laugh about how hard he got hit, and then exclaim that they got to get out of there before they get caught. The video was taken from the passenger seat, so it was quite nice of these idiots to record proof of them committing a murder. The event happened back on August 14th, but the story only hit the current news cycle after the video clip went viral on September 15th, presumably shortly after the two were arrested. Jesus Ayala had just turned 18, Jasmir Keys was 16. Ayala seemed to be under the impression that he was still a juvenile, saying to the police, You think this juvenile is going to do some time? I'll be out in 30 days, I bet you. And it's just a hit and run, slap on the wrist. Ayala had not been informed of any hit and run charges against him when he made these statements, as the police were only there to arrest him under a prior warrant. These statements and the video footage allowed the cops to slap him with 18 charges, including murder, attempted murder, and grand larceny. Ayala's mother apologized for her son's actions, saying through a translator, I don't know if God can forgive him. And yeah, despite Ayala clearly being Latino, his booking paperwork shows that the police filed him as white. Jasmir Keys was arrested on a different day and had a different appearance in court from his friend, and I wasn't able to dig up what charges he's been slapped with. But despite being 16, he's also being charged as an adult. Keyes' mother was not apologetic like Ayala's was, saying that her son's true story will come out, not these media false representations. The investigation eventually uncovered that on that same day, these guys stole three vehicles in total, hit the one guy, tried to hit another, and also committed a burglary. The man that was killed was a retired police chief, Andreas Probst. How do you pronounce that name? Probst? It's a horrible story, but it's also a really simple case. Two idiot kids went for a joyride and racked up a huge list of charges. Multiple car thefts, murder, attempted murder. It's like it's Grand Theft Auto over here. They've got physical evidence, video evidence. Ayala was stupid enough to open his dumb fuck mouth when he was being arrested. This is an open and shut case. As always, wait for the trial, who knows? Maybe some weird evidence might come out or something. But as it currently stands, I feel pretty confident that justice will be done here. The evidence is just that overwhelming. The point is, though, this story only went viral within right-wing social media circles. I follow a healthy amount of lefties online, and almost none of them are talking about it. The few that were were these fringe revolutionary ACAB types saying that props deserve it because he was a cop, and that he's also corrupt because he took a disability pension that was under legal scrutiny back in 2011, making these kids heroes for purging a corrupt pig or something like that. Though I want to make it very clear, that opinion was only expressed by a very fringe minority of the online left. The majority of leftists just seemed to be ignorant that this event even happened. Now let's take a look at the left-wing story. A video clip went viral of a Seattle police officer responding to an emergency call. He was speeding to the scene, doing 74 miles in a 25 mile per hour area, which cops are allowed to do, but he didn't have his lights or his siren on, failing to alert himself to everyone else on the road. Just like last time, this is footage of a death, so I'm not going to show the whole clip. He rams into a woman walking down the street, in pretty much the same way as the previous story. She hit the passenger side windshield and died. Afterward, he pulls over and reports the incident to dispatch, with a particularly disinterested and annoyed tone in his voice, like this is some inconvenience for him. Three married to start a supervisor, start fire for a struck pedestrian. Negative, I'm going to be on Aurora. Later on in the clip, he's caught laughing to somebody on the phone about the incident, allegedly someone from the police union, remarking that she was just a regular person who had limited value, and that the city should just cut her family an $11,000 check to make it up to them. But she is dead. <laughs> No, it's a regular person. Yeah. Yeah, 
Yeah, just write a check. Just yeah, what? <laughs> $11,000. She was 26 anyway. She had limited value. This event happened back on January 23rd, but was mostly ignored by social media until the body cam footage of the officer laughing at the woman's death was released on September 12th. The woman he killed was Janavi Kandula, an Indian immigrant to the US and a graduate student at Northeastern University. She was just finishing up her master's degree in information systems. The officer is Kevin Dave, who still works for the Seattle Police Department, though after the body cam footage went public, the Seattle Police announced they were auditing his actions and the county prosecuting attorney announced a criminal review of the incident. Despite Despite Dave's initial lack of remorse, he publicly remarked in July that he fucked up, which is, you know, putting it mildly. This is also a horrible story, but again, it's a simple case. The officer was blasting down the road at three times the speed limit without his lights or sirens on, and he hit someone. And then he has the audacity to act like it wasn't a big deal afterwards. Could that have been not a true expression of heartlessness, but rather a trauma response for him? Maybe. But the best case scenario for Dave is that he was really shook up and said some dumb shit without thinking it through, and none of that makes him innocent. He still did it. Hey, this is Future Dev recording this during editing. Even though every online source that I could find about this story says that the officer who hit the pedestrian and the officer who was caught making callous remarks on his body cam were the same officer, they might not be. While editing this video, I noticed that the two body cam feeds have a different serial number. That might mean that this is two different officers with two different cameras. However, most mainstream articles haven't pointed out that these are two different officers. All right, I just went and checked. In between my writing this script a few days ago and editing it today, the contents of a lot of these articles started getting changed. These outlets are correcting the record. This shouldn't really change the content of this video though, because this isn't about the stories themselves. It's about media bubbles and people's reaction to the stories. Anyway, let's get back to it. This story only went viral within left-wing social media circles. I also follow a healthy amount of righties online, and almost none of them were talking about it either. The few that did were these fringe white nationalist types, making jokes about India and talking about removing all the immigrants, and there was even less of these guys than the revolutionary ACAB people cheering the death of Andreas Probst in the other story. The vast majority of right-wingers just seemed to not know what was happening at all. So, we know that both of these stories didn't really have any reach across the political aisle. But how did each camp respond to their own story. Well, the right-wing response to their story was frankly pretty much all talk. Lots of people going on about how much society is decaying, civilization is collapsing, the government is inept. Some people were making it explicitly about race, since one of the two drivers was black and the other Latino. No, I don't care what the police report says, fuck you. While the victim was white. There was also a fair bit of falsehood mixed in with the truth. For example, Elon Musk posted this article from the Las Vegas Review with the headline, Retired Police Chief Killed in Bike Crash, Remembered for Laugh and Love of Coffee. With his added reaction, an innocent man was murdered in cold blood while riding his bicycle. The killers joked about it on social media. Yet, where is the media outrage? Now you begin to understand the lie. The implication here is that the headline was purposely crafted to obscure the fact that Probst was killed by calling it a bike crash. I understand this reaction. We all remember when the Washington Post called the leader of ISIS an austere religious scholar. But this time, it's actually wrong. The article in question was published on August 18th, only a few days after the event, long before anyone knew what actually happened. A subsequent article published on August 31st, after the media had viewed the video footage, explicitly outlines the hit and run. Thanks, community notes. You continue to help everybody out, even if it means shitting on Elon in the process. Everyone's favorite culture warrior, Ian Miles Chiang, showed up with this video clip from a press conference discussing the event. We believe that Andy's murder is a direct result of society's decayed family values and the strong effects that social media has on our youth. We as a family in no way feel that Andy's murder was based on race or profession. It was a random act of violence. We ask you to not politicize or use Andy's murder to fuel political agendas or to create cultural wars. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think his description of this clip as Prope's daughter doesn't blame the assailants, holds social media responsible, and her devotion to diversity is unshaken is an accurate description. In fact, that sounds like spin. It's pretty reasonable to assume that this wasn't a targeted attack against white people. It was two joyriding retards who are sociopathic enough to think that hitting somebody constitutes fun. If it were a non-white cyclist, I have no doubt they would have also run him down for their laughs. The opposite of this claim, that it's somehow this racially motivated anti-white attack, is Tariq Nasheed's take, 
who came out and said that the two were actually white Hispanics, making this a case of white on white crime. These people are all just retarded. Most of the right wing reactions appealed to the same sentiment that Elon did when he asked, where is the media outrage? There were lots of people saying, where's the outrage in fact? An editorial on the New York Post titled, Andreas Probst murder shows lefty media's willful blind spots, states that the crime is so violent, so nihilistic, one would expect a national spotlight on it, yet that simply hasn't happened in the month since the killing. The New York Times, the Washington Post, and CNN are all in the wind. This appears to be mostly true. As of the making of this video, neither the New York Times or CNN have reported on this event, as far as I can tell. The Washington Post did publish an article one day after the New York Post lambasted them for ignoring the story, but framed it in the context of the hate mob that Elon Musk apparently sent towards the Las Vegas Review for the seemingly inaccurate headline. Same thing with the Seattle Times. In fact, most of the news outlets reporting on this event are right-wing ones, like the New York Post or the Daily Mail. Though Huffington Post, to their credit, is one left-wing outlet that wasn't afraid to tackle the issue. However, when people ask, where's the outrage, they're not just talking about, where's the media coverage? They're also asking, where's the public statements by politicians? Where's the protests and the riots and the marches and the chanting in front of the government buildings? Where's the acceptance of the victim as the next cultural martyr? Where's the national days of mourning or the statues or whatever else? What they're basically asking is, why isn't Andreas Probst being treated like George Floyd? They're both victims, and Probst is certainly a better man of character than Floyd was. And the conclusion that people on the right wing come to is, it's because Probst is white and white victims make bad martyrs. Sometimes their conclusion is that the perpetrators are non-white, but most of the time it's that the victim is white and the cathedral does not commemorate white victims. That is the right wing view of the situation. At the same time though, all of those right wing people who were outraged, they only seem to be outraged online. As far as I can tell, they didn't get together to march on city hall or anything like that, but the people outraged at the left wing story, they absolutely did. Now it is true that there absolutely was more of a mainstream media reaction to the killing of Giovanni Cadula. CNN, Washington Post, NBC, New York Times. But there was also a larger grassroots response as well. Online petitions, protests, marches in a bunch of major American cities. Did the mainstream media response only happen because of the grassroots activism, cluing them into the story? That's possible. Leftists do tend to do more on the ground marches and activism than rightists. The leftist tendency to protest and riot in real life might have been the driving factor here. Or did the mainstream media response cause that grassroots activism by pushing the story into the news cycle? That's also very possible. It might be the case that there was no real life outrage over the Probst killing because of a media failure in comparison to the media shining their spotlight on the Kandula killing. It's hard to tell. The earliest tweets about the Kandula story from this news cycle are from around the same time as the earliest articles were published. So we don't really know whether the chicken or the egg came first. First. Could it be because of the stories themselves? The first is about two non-white youths driving around in a stolen car and killing a random white guy for kicks, who just happened to be a retired cop. It doesn't seem like they killed him because he was white, and they didn't know he was a cop, but those two things are absolutely factors in choosing not to report on the story if the outlet in question is biased towards the left. The second story is about a cop killing a brown female student immigrant and going viral for showing no remorse about his actions. Now the demographics have switched places, and the left, being very anti-cop and very pro-immigrant, is much more inclined to report on the story. Otherwise, these stories are pretty identical. Killing an innocent with a car and showing an extreme lack of remorse for doing so. The issue, ultimately, is that the right-leaning media reported on both stories, while the left-leaning media only reported on the story that favored their politics. That's actually a very serious problem, and why you need to consume news from across the political spectrum. No, you can't only consume right-wing media just because they report on both stories. They still put spins on stories that don't suit their interests. Fox News is legendary for that. You cannot remain in those echo chambers that I started the video off talking about, and somehow still call yourself informed. Yeah, right-wing media might have reported on both both of these stories while left-wing media didn't, and that's bad. But that means at least the average leftoid has an excuse to only get outraged over one story. They exist in a news bubble that doesn't allow them to learn about the other one. Your average rightoid, reading their own media sources, had the opportunity to learn about both tragedies, and nonetheless, they still only focus their online outrage towards the one that suited their political views better. When I look at this picture, I see not only two news bubbles that have limited overlap, but two fundamentally different views of reality. It's important to understand that when somebody has a true belief about the world, that's not some theory for them. That's how reality actually looks from their point of view. Let me give you an example. Let's say that I'm accused of murder. The police find some physical evidence of me at the crime scene. There's some fingerprints, there's my hair or something. Now let's say in reality, the objective truth is that I didn't actually murder the guy. 
I just happened to walk through the area two minutes before. Most other people, not knowing my experiences because they didn't live them, will believe that I'm the murderer. And from their point of view, the story of reality will read that I killed somebody and got away with it. From my point of view, people treating me coldly due to their belief will appear insane to me because my reading of the story of reality says that I'm innocent. We both have different beliefs about what reality is, but those beliefs don't feel like beliefs from the point of view of the believer. They feel like reality itself. So to the rightoid who is in their media bubble, the story of reality reads like nobody gives a shit about two non-white kids callously running down a retired white cop because nobody's out there protesting, nobody's rioting, nobody's starting social movements, nobody's reporting on it in the mainstream media. While to the leftoids who are in their media bubble, the story of reality reads like nobody gives a shit about a young immigrant woman who was callously run down by a cop because it's taken six months and a possible body cam leak to the media to even get an investigation off the ground. Which belief is the actual reality? It's probably a bit of both, as unsatisfying an answer as that is. But it is undeniable that in this case, the left-leaning media dropped the ball on covering the right story, while at the same time, right-leaning people had more of an opportunity to care about the left story and still failed to do so. This kind of reminds me of the train derailment situation in Palestine, Ohio at the start of the year. People were screaming about how it wasn't going viral and no one's talking about it, when before it went viral on Twitter, CNN and other news outlets actually were publishing articles about the event. It's just that nobody cared until that one dude stood underneath that unnaturally darkened sky and yelled that there was an emergency happening and nobody was paying attention to them. Maybe it really is one of those type of things, where if you want an event to get attention, you gotta make way more noise, both online and offline. Or maybe it's a media failure. Again, probably a bit of both. Oh well. I can't change any institutions, and I certainly can't change large swaths of individuals. I'm just a random, overweight nerd. It's just you and me here right now. So I'll leave you with a bit of advice. Push yourself to step outside of your wheelhouse and consume ideas that you wouldn't naturally gravitate towards. The algorithm wants to push you content pre-made for you. Resist that, and seek something you wouldn't normally enjoy. If you refuse to read a specific news outlet due to its partisan nature, start reading it. You're smart enough to cut through their bullshit on your own. You don't need to avoid them. And yes, this applies to both sides. We all know about the crying leftoid snowflakes who block everyone on social media and they desperately want to make the entire world their safe space where they don't have to suffer any pushback for their dog shit socialist arguments, who think that you're literally killing trannies by using the wrong pronouns and all that retarded shit. But do you think the right doesn't do that too? I'm a co-host on the Archcast with my friend Arch Warhammer. He's way more right wing than me by far, while his audience is way further right than either of us. His chat is full of libertarians and ANCAPs, and I'm considered a communist over there. And whenever I show up, there's that small vocal contingent of people who begin to scream that they can't handle me being here. They can't watch the show anymore. They gotta unsub. They can't take hearing opinions they disagree with. These guys are just snowflakes. They're right-wing snowflakes in a right-wing safe space, just like the leftoids. And in both cases, these people are intellectually stunted. They have no response to being challenged other than to soy out. We've all got a little bit of snowflake inside of us, guys. It is uncomfortable to be pushed back on. I get it. But part of growing up is killing the snowflake and accepting that people you really disagree with do actually have some good points worth hearing. Anyway, that's all for me today, guys. Naomi and I watched that god-fucking-awful Strays movie. So check that vlog out. I'll also be streaming tonight, so come say hello. Okay, I'll see you guys next time. I love you.